Acapulco, Mexico. This is Anarchast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have a first-time guest coming in. It's actually a friend of a past Anarchast guest, Mark Victor, the uh, lawyer, the uh, attorneyforfreedom.com lawyer, uh, anarchist, uh, past speaker at Anarchapoco. And uh, uh, the person I have on today is Andy Marcantel. He's a criminal defense attorney in the same firm as Mark Victor. Uh, and he was just telling me that he spends all day just fighting the government and trying to free people. And that's exactly what we love here. And uh, so I wanted to have him on. So, Andy, thanks for coming on but I gotta make sure, are you, uh, how did you become an anarchist? Well, Jeff, thank you for having me on. That's a great question because uh, the, the anarchy, uh, full-blown ideology is kind of, uh, I, I consider it kind of a late in the game. I'm a late in the game anarchist. Uh, and the reason is, is because uh, I simply had other focus, philosophically speaking, uh, than uh, how I think the government should be assembled or if there even should be one assembled. I have a, a background in moral philosophy, ethical philosophy, all my undergraduate and a lot of my graduate work, even through law school, uh, was in uh, moral and le legal ethics. And um, the, uh, the, the first thing I had to figure out as a uh, young philosopher and young lawyer in training was to figure out exactly what I uh, think uh, the ethical code and moral code of people should be. How should we treat one another? Um, and after um, poring over uh, uh, countless thinkers and worldviews, both Eastern and Western, uh, I came to a, uh, the conclusion that I came to is this, that uh, coercion through force or threat of force is a bad thing. And um, as it turned out, when I then um, started doing my job as, uh, as a lawyer, as a defense attorney in my community, and uh, as you put it, fighting the government every day. Um, that's when I started to see, you've heard, you've, I'm sure you've heard the, uh, the old adage, uh, you never want to see how the sausage is made uh, <laughs> that, because that'll turn you off to the sausage and you probably will never look at the end product the same again. Uh, the, those first few years as a defense attorney, um, especially at a, uh, at a hardcore pro-freedom firm like the one that I work at, and uh, the type of uh, work that Mark Victor does as well at this firm. Uh, that type of work is seeing how the sausage is made. It's disgusting, it's dirty, it reveals a lot about the system in which you're in. And um, after uh, turning my focus to that in the first few years of my practice, I quickly realized that uh, an anarchist ideology is the only one that was consistent with my ethical viewpoints and, and my moral viewpoints. And, um, and the only one consistent with this concept of avoiding uh, coercion through force. So that is how I became an anarchist, my friend. Oh, that's great. So there's at least two anarchist lawyers in the U.S. Uh, for anyone out there, if you ever have a problem, uh, I've actually called Mark once uh, when a friend of mine spilt his drink in a club in Las Vegas and about 12 cops all jumped on him and took him away. We couldn't even find him. Uh, Mark helped us to find him and get him out. Uh, so it's good to know some uh, good freedom-minded lawyers. So uh, wh why don't you give us some insights into what you saw about how dirty and corrupt the system is? Well, I mean, it's funny you tell the um, the story about your friend, and that seems like such a menial, uh, small little, uh, such a minor infraction, such a de minimis infraction that you can't believe that our government is spending time and money um, uh, that they have also taken through coercion and force from their citizenry uh, in order to prosecute people like your friend. Um, and I would have been shocked by that um, before my first few years as a lawyer in this state. Um, I am sad to say now that I am no longer shocked by that kind of a prosecution. Um, we have seen everything. I mean, we handle very serious felony offenses at this firm, uh, but we also handle lots of uh, freedom on the edges type uh, crimes. Um, your, your story that you share reminds me of one uh, in the office right now that's received some local publicity because we've been pretty loudmouth about it because of the horrendously ethically shocking qualities of the case. But uh, we have our government prosecuting people for using the F word. That's right. People are using the F word and other people are being offended by it. And now our clients are getting charged with disorderly conduct and things of that nature. It's, it would blow your mind, um, some of the things that, uh, that our government spends money prosecuting. But not only um, substantive law, because that's what we're talking about, right? Those things that 
um, shouldn't be illegal in the first place, shouldn't receive any sort of punishment in the first place. The drug war comes to mind, and, and as uh, you can probably guess, that makes up a pretty good percentage of my clientele. Um, the the uh, state is required to list who the victim in a given crime is whenever they uh, prosecute a, um, a defendant in this case. And uh, it would uh, probably shock somebody not involved every day in the system to see how many times that victim is listed as the state of Arizona or the United States government or some other spooky specter faceless uh, victim that uh, is never going to show up to court and doesn't actually have a pulse. See that kind of stuff all the time. So the substantive law totally screwed up. Um, but as far as other things that uh, have made me, made me a bit uh, uh, jaded, I guess you can say, um, with the system is um, how the procedure works. How, um, how, for instance, prosecutors are able to wield the punishments of horrendously over-penalized crime um, over people in order to get them to take uh, uh, plea deals that um, on cases that they really should be taking to trial and putting in front of a jury of their peers. Um, the way that the system is structured because of the uh, horrendous overpenalization of so many of the uh, crimes in this state is pretty much one where defendants are uh, set up to fail, uh, where um, you'd have to be an idiot. And even, even a pro-freedom lawyer at that point would, would be sitting there advising you, you can't take this to trial. You can't know, um, um, no reasonable person, given the fact that you could spend the rest of your life locked up in a cage, um, wouldn't take this deal. Um, unfortunately, that uh, causes even the most freedom-minded of attorneys at times to uh, advise their clients um, that uh, sometimes making the plea deal and the handshake deal with the prosecutor and, and um, make it a deal with the devil essentially is the best way to go. Um, and that's the tough part about what we do. There's so many cases that we want to bring to trial, that we want to fight the government, we want to make them carry their burden. But at the, uh, at the end of the day, our number one primary goal is to the clients. And um, you know, it's, uh, when, you, when you see it from this perspective and you actually see the sausage being made and you see the, the inner workings of how the um, government has structured um, its justice system. It, uh, it's enough to make you um, question its legitimacy, to say the least. Yeah, to say the least, especially there in the U.S. The U.S. is pretty much the most out-of-control police state in the world. Uh, there might be a few others. Uh, I don't know of them. Uh, I've never been to uh, North Korea. It's probably worse. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. has more people in cages than any other country in, in the world by far. I think something like more than uh, every other country total, I think. It's, it's a massive amount. Um, mm. And as you pointed out, and I've seen this so many times, like I, I actually spent a lot of time here in Mexico. I've never known anyone who's like, oh, I got arrested on this and I got to show up at court on this date. They just don't even have that here. <laughs> uh, unless you did something incredibly serious, like murder somebody or, or, or something along those lines, it's pretty much, it's not going to be uh, dealt with that way. Um, and, but Jeff, I did a little bit of, just on that note, I did a little bit of research on you um, in preparation for this interview. And uh, you make uh, your, your home in Acapulco sound like paradise. I always, uh, I've seen several videos of you lounging on beaches, smoking cigarettes, um, perhaps those around you drinking a cocktail, having a, a grand old time. And um, I got to tell you, you, uh, you make me pretty jealous at uh, points. I'd love to come and visit you down there. Well, I think you're coming to the uh, next Anarchapoco conference, if I'm not mistaken, right? I will, I will absolutely be down there, and I hope that you'll uh, take the liberty of showing me around and introducing to me some folks so I can get a taste of, uh, of your world as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's a whole week of events. So everyone's going to be around. There's lots of parties, lots of hanging around. Uh, so you'll definitely see that. It's a totally different world by far. Uh, but one thing I've noticed, though, is uh, you know, all my American friends, they've all been kidnapped at some point by the police. Uh, they've all ended up in a cage at some point. They've all been <laughs> you know, in a court or having to do some sort of plea deal. And that brings up uh, your point is I've, I've heard from so many of them. They're like, yeah, I got caught with a plant in my pocket. Uh, and they said it'd be like 10 years in jail or I can take a plea and get like a year of probation or something. And I think part of that is they're arresting so many people in the U.S. that there's just no possible way they could actually take it all to court, could they? 
Remember my uh, my brief anecdote I gave about uh, our client who's uh, currently being charged with a crime for saying the F word. <laughs> um, God forbid she should, uh, you know, say something that supposedly we all thought was protected by the First Amendment. Apparently the First Amendment goes out the window as soon as somebody gets offended by it. But I bring up that story again to kind of answer your question. There's so much that is penalized. These statutes that we have in our country are so overbroad and so vague and they can be twisted and turned by prosecutors. We have seen the most outlandish theories of prosecution that they just generate so, they cast such a broad net that pretty much anything can be prosecuted um, by any prosecutor at any time. I'll share a brief anecdote um, with you about this notion of overbroad statutes and, and generating crime out of nothing. We had a uh, case that Mark and I worked on one time where there was a, uh, our client was a uh, security guard and um, he was growing a legal uh, medical marijuana grow, an actual state-sanctioned medical marijuana grow. Uh, around midnight, there were some invaders that were coming, it looked like a gang that were coming up on the horizon. Uh, he spotted them on his binoculars and um, immediately ran and called the uh, police and said, you know, we need some help over here. Uh, the police then came to the scene and they erroneously thought that a different building other, other than the one that was reported where the guys were actually, the bad guys were actually hiding, they erroneously thought it was a different building. The police then approached that different building, kicked in the door essentially, pointed guns around and it turned out to be an innocent family that was slumbering in their beds. Well, my client was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon for each person who was in that building, the, the erroneous building, because the state's theory of the case was that his actions directly caused the police to commit assault against the innocent family, and therefore they charged him with several major felonies. Are you getting the idea of what I'm talking about here, that you can pretty much prosecute anybody for anything at any time in this country? Oh, absolutely. I've heard so many horror stories. I actually think that, you know, people should never call the cops in the U.S. because that stuff happens all the time. Not just that, but uh, they'll come and kick in your doors and they'll, they'll uh, cost you. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, so many people get charged. The only charge is uh, uh, resisting arrest. I always love that one. It's like, well, what were you arresting him for? Well, we weren't, but he resisted arrest. Right. Uh, the, like the, law, the law on that is you can't even uh, resist an unlawful arrest. Uh, e <laughs> even if the arrest is unlawful, you're not allowed to resist. That's what's on the books right now. It's shocking. Yeah, it's uh, out of control. It must be crazy for you to be sort of living in it and having to see it every day. Well, um, this brings up an important point, though, that I kind of uh, I feel the need it's important to say, um, speaking fondly about the prospects of your uh, wonderful, beautiful beach paradise that I'll soon be visiting uh, shortly here at the next Anarchopolco, which I'm very excited for. But um, an important point that I think needs to be brought up is simply because there are better places that are less tyrannical and perhaps have less government interference doesn't mean that that's um, always a reason to move away from it. I mean, I think that freedom, it really is, um, the, the true battles are on the fringes. Uh, you go and if you want to change hearts and minds, you go to where the battle is. Um, I live in a, a crazy state called Arizona um, and as much as I love it for its topograph topographical features and its beautiful weather year-round, uh, the, the policies are all screwed up here. Uh, the marijuana policies are completely screwed up. In this state, uh, we have medical marijuana, but you can still be thrown in a cage for having it without a medical marijuana card. You can be placed on probation for drugs and then smoke marijuana while you're on probation for drugs <laughs> so long as you have the medical marijuana card. The whole thing is very nutty and screwed up. And, you know, I think it's it's bringing, and we laugh now when we say these things aloud, but I live in a state with millions of people uh, who, who aren't complaining about these things until it happens to them. And I find that going to a place where people are being victimized in such a nonsensical way by your government is really a great chance to 
change hearts and minds in the right direction. Um, you know, on this point, I'd say about 95, I mean, as a criminal defense attorney, I represent some bad dudes. I've definitely represented some bad dudes who I wouldn't want living next door to me. Um, but those are very few and far between. The vast majority of my clients, I'd say 95, 98% of my clients are perfectly decent people uh, who I would love to have living next door to me, um, who never thought it would happen to them and, and happen to be charged with a crime that they never expected and were usually at the wrong place, wrong time. Those people become, through that adversity, they become educated about our system. And, um, you know, I've had so many clients tell me, you know, until I was accused of this crime, if I ever heard about anybody accused of that crime, I passed all sorts of judgments on them and everything like that. Now, through education, through adversity, and through the help of, um, of not feeling guilty about disagreeing with your government that loudmouths like Mark and I and people at my firm try to instill in our clients and, and our friends and just people in our day-to-day -day lives, going through that adversity, those people who are charged with that crime now will be a little bit more critical before passing any sort of moral judgment just because the government says that they've decided that they've done something that they disagree with them. They, they, will, they will always take a second look at it for the rest of their life having experienced that. And I think that going to the battlefield, the place where, as, uh, as uh, Mark puts it, where the rubber hits the road, that zone where um, it's, not a, it's not a TV show anymore, it's not a philosophical debate anymore, it is actually that zone where the government is trying to grab you and place you in a cage, steal your money, impose supervised release on you, all kinds of different things. That's the place where you got to go to really change the hearts and minds, and uh, that's what we're doing here in Arizona. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you are. I'm not. Uh, I don't. I'm not here in Acapulco because I'm. I'm saying everyone should run away from the U.S. or anything like that. I just prefer to be here. I. I just. I'd rather just do this on webcam and and uh, talk about how bad it is up there and not actually get arrested all the time, which I'm sure I. W I actually have been in. Yeah, uh, so many times I've been in handcuffs in the U.S. It's the only time I've been in handcuffs. I'm not into BDSM or anything like that. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, it was once I walked out of a, a bar with a drink. I forgot I wasn't in Mexico anymore, and I was just on the sidewalk uh, talking on the phone I couldn't hear uh, inside uh, three squad cars surrounded me handcuffs thrown to the thrown against the wall uh, the other time I was just walking in Palm Springs and five squad cars surrounded me one with a floodlight and uh, they put me against the car really rough and I said uh, what are you doing and they said well, you look drunk and I said well I am drunk but uh, <laughs> so and That's uh, tax dollars at work and <laughs> it's, it's it's really it's really sad um, that you you know you bring up the open container law which happens to be in place in the year uh, 2016, which is constantly changing. All these regulatory laws constantly changing. But um, you know, it's funny. I was I'm from Louisiana originally, and I was in New Orleans visiting um, in uh, early September, and I went with a group of friends, and they were all blown away by, oh my gosh, I can take a beer out into the street. I can walk around without worrying about getting arrested. And but that was just a moment of reflection for us. We said, think how sad it is that we're that we're so happy that the government of this particular city has given us the right to carry this liquid out onto onto a roadway. It's really a, kind of a, a sad thing when you think about it. We're we're feeding off of scraps off the government's table. Yeah, well, it's not like the the city's giving you the right to do it. You have the right to do it. It's just they're not uh, <laughs> costing you for when you do do it. That's a more um, accurate way of putting it. Yeah, but uh, you bring up an interesting point about how when, once people see the system, they usually, their eyes open. Uh, it's just sad that people need to actually personally witness these things before they try to do anything to change it. And that's really the sadness of government. And that's why government rarely ever, you know, rescinds. It, it always just grows. So look at the U.S. government, the smallest government in the world, the freest government in the world 200 and some odd years ago, now the largest, the biggest police state. Uh, that's just the way these things go. And it's actually some of the founding fathers, as they call them. I think that sounds so religious <laughs> to me. Uh, it's so weird when people say that. Oh, is my founding father oh, really related? Uh, no. Uh, well, why are you calling him that? But it, they actually had some good ideas about government. They were trying out really small government, which is, you know, let's try it let's see what happens uh and uh they um 
uh, one of them said, you know, basically, if you're going to have a government, everyone who's in that place really needs to pay attention to the government. And I think it was one of them who said every 15 years or so, you got to, you know, just chop down the blood soaked tree or something like that. <laughs> it's like, why would you create a system where you got to do that in the first place? But, you know, whatever, they did it. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, that's the thing, like so many people in the US or actually pretty much any country in the world, uh, they don't really pay that much attention. They're usually just work and they're doing their own things. They're just living their own lives. And unfortunately, because of that, the government can just continue to do all these insane things and just ruin so many lives. It's a, uh, I think it's a large matter of indoctrination. Uh, we're told um, from a very uh, young age that we live in the best country there is, that we're the freest country there is, that we're the happiest country there is. Um, and to disagree with that concept is uh, you're often demonized. Um, you're marginalized uh, by your fellow flag wavers. And I think that's a, a really sad thing that has a lot to do with um, your reflection that it's really sad that people need to actually be yanked by the government who's attempting to put them in a cage to have that epiphany. Um, no, I couldn't agree more. It's a very sad thing, but um, you know, it's there are people that can get that without having that experience, um, and uh, it has to be. However, it has to be people who are looking for a change. It has to be if people are satisfied with um, with uh, the status quo and with their government, and they have a nice cushy life. The bottom line is they're not going to go and look for an alternative. Um, but this is one of the reasons, Jeff, why I am actually um, a, a hopeful anarchist and I'm hopeful about the state of uh, the United States because people are getting tired of this shit. People are, are legitimately getting tired of it and they're getting fed up with this. And um, I think the, the distrust of the government has written, risen significantly in recent years, largely I think and due to the rise in technology, free exchange of information, social media, cameras in everybody's pocket, recording police misconduct, which by the way, uh, formed the basis of the majority of our civil rights claims in this office. If cameras didn't exist, um, most of our civil rights claims that we do nowadays, we wouldn't even be talking about them. Uh, because there would be insufficient evidence and as it turns out whenever the guy with the uh, gun and the shiny badge uh, puts his word against that of the common citizen um, then the the guy in the black robe says that the the guy with the badge is more credible so um, I think uh, these leaps in technology and social media and free exchange of information um, are really helping to uh, cause that dissonance and I think we're um, you know, if, if things don't change pretty quick, I think we might be due for one of those Jeffersonian revolutions you were talking about earlier, where that tree of uh, liberty might be needed to be watered with blood eventually. Hopefully it won't come to that. I'm a man of peace myself, and I hope to see uh, peaceful change. But, um, you know, I think those words are prophetic and at least should be a wake-up call. Yeah, you brought up a great point earlier about indoctrination. Of course, uh, the government has the kids all through their childhood now in the government indoctrination camps, the public schools, uh, where they teach them a lot of this garbage and get them indoctrinated. They have to do their Pledge of Allegiance. Again, it's all very religious, all very, uh, it's, it's a very superstitious religious sort of a thing. Then they go home, they turn on the TV, and oh, it's the football game. Well, first we've got to stand for the national anthem, and here comes the military jets, so they're protecting us, and the flags, and all, you know, so they're just completely indoctrinated. And you break up a good point, and I'm, I'm always very hopeful as well, and I, I, I think the U.S. is one of the... I'm less hopeful about the U.S. than I am about other parts of the world, just because they're so indoctrinated, they don't, just don't seem to get it. But I, I do see a lot of stuff going on as well. I see on the internet people are waking up. You're seeing people uh, turning away from the mainstream media. It's now got less than 10% of people actually believe it's actual truth uh, information. <laughs> How could think, you? How could you after this last election? What a what a fiasco that was. Everything we were told the old time, the whole time turned out to be a pile of BS and. Uh, exchange of information on the internet showed us that uh, these supposedly neutral sources were uh, colluding secretly in back rooms with uh, candidacies and how could you possibly um, trust uh, mainstream media at this point their asses are hanging out at this point the emperor has no clothes at this point with, with regard to that 
Yeah, it is fake news. And of course, they're saying everything on the internet is fake news. The mainstream media isn't. You know, it's all Orwell. They, they twist everything upside down. Uh, but uh, you know, even the uh, faith and our trust in government is on a, a long down uh, uh, slope. Uh, I think there's less than 5% of people uh, like, uh, uh, like their Congress people. Um, that's like, you know, like a, a rounding error. It's almost nobody. Uh, so people are waking up. But I think the confusion is because they've been indoctrinated so much about, oh, democracy is great, and the U.S. wasn't even really a democracy when it started. Right. Uh, you know, all this has been indoctrinated into them. That That's, I think, a little bit why Donald Trump is so popular. People are like, okay, he's going to change the system. They don't really get it. You, you don't change the system from within. You just stop obeying the system. Just get rid of the system. Get rid of the U.S. federal government. Just go back to all 50 states like Adam Kokesh wants at first. Uh, things like that. But they don't really fully get it yet. Uh, so it's, it's a very interesting time. We have this awakening going on, but they don't fully get the answer yet. And that's when you see all these guys in the U.S. driving down the road and they've got the uh, don't tread on me flag. And then right beside <laughs> it, they've got like the U.S. flag or a Blue Lives Matter flag. And it's like, oh, the cognitive dissonance in some of these people. Like you're saying two completely separate things there with those flags, but they don't fully get it yet. Yeah, I mean, complete, that, that last example you gave, obviously, completely logically inconsistent. <laughs> um, just back to, um, you know, you talking about uh, uh, the people's di growing dissatisfaction with the government, and uh, particularly in the context of this last election. My favorite statistic was something like 11% of uh, Americans, given the choice between Hillary becoming president, Donald Trump becoming president, um, or a uh, giant meteor destroying <laughs> civilization as we know it. I think something like 11% of people chose the meteor, uh, which should tell you something about the overall satisfaction of people with their government right now. Uh, but on to a different point you brought up. Any thought? Any, any people who think that Donald Trump isn't uh, is going to be the answer to their problems and shaking up the establishment and changing uh, the government and not going to be a, a crony and, and put people in power uh, for their own end or for his ends rather than their ends? They're completely uh, delusional. There's no reason whatsoever to think that he's going to do any of that stuff. But I, I think he sold himself as if he was going to do that stuff and. Um, that well, that's what you, politicians do, right? Yeah, that's exactly what they do. <laughs> we it's won't get fooled again by the by the who. Like this happens every four years forever. Right? Right. It's, it happened with Barack Obama when he came in. I remember, and I wrote this scathing thing about Barack Obama uh, right as soon as he got elected. And a lot of people were like, "Oh no, no, he's going to change everything. He's going to close Guantanamo Bay. He's going to end the wars. He he already won the Nobel Peace Prize. He hasn't even started yet. And uh, you know, war after war doesn't close Guantanamo. He was supposed to help out the black people. You remember there was some people on. YouTube back then who were like, ooh, I, I don't have to pay for anything ever again. And uh, what's happened? We've had this massive issue with police brutality against a lot of black people. Well, Barack Obama, the half black president, is, is president. So now we've got Trump, and I agree with you completely, uh, that uh, if you actually listen to what he said, uh, most of the stuff he's not going to do, he's already recanted on it. He said, oh, we're going to put Hillary in jail as soon as he gets elected. Oh, no, they're good people. Uh, you know, I'm going to drain the swamp. It's all Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, all, all his uh, crony capitalist friends. Um, the one, one closest thing, what, to me is his wall. Uh, you know, I'm, I, as a, I'm in Arizona, I'm in a border state. Um, and uh, there's a whole lot of drug traffic that comes through here. And uh, Donald Trump whipped everybody up about this wall that Mexico was going to pay for and, um, you know, is now recanting. Well, certain parts of it, I suppose, can be more of a fence than a wall um, or, you know, kind of like a digital wall or whatever the hell else uh, his recantations are. I can't even follow it anymore. Yeah, building a wall across an entire continent, and they're, you know, <laughs> the whole uh, immigration issue is a completely uh, BS to begin with. There's actually been more Mexicans leaving the U.S. over the last five years than going to the U.S. because it's it's the freedom. There's hardly any left there, and the economy is not as good there, whereas it's a lot better in Mexico lately. Uh, but one of the things that he did say before he got elected, and, and he got a lot of cheers for it, was he's going to increase the police state. Well, the, the U.S. already has the worst police state. Uh, stop and frisks everywhere. Like, so he actually, I think he's going to actually follow through on those ones. Uh, so we could actually see an even worse police state under Donald Trump. And he doesn't even want to get rid of the drug war. That wasn't even a topic. Uh, you know, most of, you know, almost everyone's like, let's get rid of this drug war. But that wasn't even a topic, a topic of his. Uh, so it looks like the drug war is going to continue and the police state's now going to increase under Trump.
As much as I appreciate uh, Mr. Trump doing everything he can, or at least claiming he's going to do everything he can to generate a lot of business for my law firm in terms of uh, criminal defense and uh, complete violations of the government and civil rights suit, I appreciate that, but uh, it, it does worry me quite a bit. Yeah, and uh, you know, one of the things I say about the whole legal system is, and I say this a lot, and I don't mean it against you, I say I hate lawyers. Um, but what I mean by that is the lawyers who are really into the system, and you're not and Mark's not, you're just trying to help people. Like if you guys weren't there, they'd be totally screwed. Uh, but uh, so many people, they're just, you know, this whole, uh, every, everything's involved with the government, right? So the government makes a law that drugs are illegal. Then the, the cops go out, they're all getting paid by money that's been extorted from people. They go out, they find people with some flowers in their, in their house. They bust down their door, shoot their dog, throw them in a cage. Then the, uh, the jail system, of course, a lot of it's private, but even if it's not, it doesn't matter. They, they uh, love it. No, our jails are all full, great. We all have jobs. Uh, then they bring the guy in in front of a judge who works for the government, uh, and he does. He he's liking this. It's like, oh look, my whole docket's you know full. This is great. Uh, the prosecutor, another guy. He's like, oh great, yeah, let's bring in more more people to uh, to prosecute. Uh, the only people that I might give some leeway to are the defense attorneys. I wonder what your take is on that. Are, are like most of the defense attorneys generally decent people or do you think some of them are kind of just like yeah let's just keep this going sort of thing that's a great question and one of the reasons one of the highest compliments that we get all the time I consider it to be the highest compliment I get is uh, you know why I love you guys and why I always come to you guys and why I tell everybody I know about you guys you first guys of all, aren't first like, of all it's really sad that he always comes to you guys <laughs> poor guy he's like I, every I, week I think I think some <laughs> clients should probably have punch cards and maybe some frequent flyer miles um, associated with their <laughs> criminal records but um, so first off one of the highest compliments that I think that we get at this firm is uh, the reason why we come to you guys and why our friends told us to come to you guys and why we tell people about your firm is because you guys aren't like other defense attorneys. You guys rock the boat. Um, many, many um, defense attorneys might as well be uh, the second prosecutor in my opinion. Um, you will oftentimes see the good old boy mentality of let's make as few waves as possible. Let's make a handshake deal here in order to get the case out the door as quick as possible. Um, and it's, um, it's frightening, really, because the system says that lawyers like that and with that kind of a track record um, are sufficient to uh, satisfy uh, your right to an attorney and to be... Um, equally represented at the table of justice. That's a frightening thought to me. So we strive to uh, throw as many hand grenades as possible, to rock the boat as much as possible, um, to create as much headache and as many problems for everybody involved, um, from the prosecutor to the judges to the court staff. Um, we raise all kinds of hell. And the sad thing about that concept is, is that we have, we have come to know the system um, and the, the um, congestion and the crippling uh, caseload so much that we use it as a, a tool in our toolbox. Oftentimes uh, when you have a prosecutor uh, who you know to be particularly lazy or that you know works in a court with a crushing caseload, you can oftentimes gain leverage just in virtue of creating work for said prosecutor, filing a bunch of motions and then coming to them afterwards and saying, look, I just filed a bunch of motions which is going to create hours and hours and hours of work for you, but if you'd like to negotiate and give me this and this or that, then you can avoid doing all of that work. Wouldn't that be great? And you could use the, the laziness of the system uh, and the inefficiency and crippling bureaucracy of it all uh, in the best interest of your clients. It really is. Um, and, and as much as I uh, enjoy employing that technique, because at the end of the day, my, um, my duty is to my client, um, it is a sad reflection to think that uh, those are each and every case like that that I just described to you is one that is settling because of a procedural um, problem with our system rather than the actual justice, rather than the act uh, and the facts themselves being scrutinized. So that's a, another ugly uh, part about our system, but um, you know, it's one that's important to know. Um, if you want to be a good defense attorney in this system, not one that's just going to go in and make a deal and, and, um, 
and send you out the door like cattle and crank you through as quick as possible. It's all about um, uh, going above and beyond that and actually rising to the level of uh, uh, taking a stand against the system, even even if that's filing a motion to dismiss the case for an unconstitutional statute, which we're known to do quite a bit, and um, you know we're we're not afraid here to challenge the laws themselves because we can we can sit here and um, you know make uh, you know fight cases uh, dealing with uh, corrupt laws all day and think that we get a good deal or a bad deal or what are the risks associated with going to trial. But if the substantive law underlying everything is crap, if these are, if, we're, if all we're talking about at the end of the day are victimless crimes that shouldn't even be laws in the first place, then we're just, it, it's, uh, it's hardly a reflection of justice. And that's, uh, that's what we're fighting every day to fix. Yeah, that's awesome. I follow Mark a lot, and he does so much great stuff. He gets in the media and, and really uh, fights it, uh, so I really respect what you guys are doing. Uh, do you do many jury trials? Yes, uh, I, I've done many jury trials. I've done uh, uh, several with Mark um, in cases requiring two attorneys. Some cases uh, under our laws require two attorneys, such as death penalty cases, which Mark and I have worked on together. Um, others are uh, incredibly complex cases. Not all cases are equal. There are some cases with very simple facts. There are others that require um, several lawyers to work on. So um, yes, we we uh, put things in front of juries, which is one of my favorite things to do, um, because when you have a jury in front of you, you're uh, essentially bypassing, at least to some extent, um, you're essentially bypassing the whims of the prosecutor, who who they have. Uh, unfettered discretion in the pleas that they offer your client and how they try the case and what their crazy theory of criminal liability is. Uh, you're also bypassing to some extent the judge. Um, we don't, uh, and that's something that uh, in every single jury trial that Mark and I have tried, that's something that we pump up the juries about, that even the judge doesn't have the power that the jury wields when they're sitting in that box. The uh, founding fathers, uh, that spooky founding fathers that we were talking about earlier, they didn't trust those judges. They didn't trust them for good reason. Oftentimes these judges are um, former prosecutors, employees of the state. Uh, you're asking the state to find that what the state did was unreasonable. Um, for that reason, at least somebody in this nation's history uh, recognize that that's probably not a good person to trust with the final decision of guilt or innocence. And that's one of my favorite parts about putting something in front of a jury is um, getting them pumped up and feeling um, their uh, kind of a duty of morality to their fellow man. It's, uh, it's, it's a really powerful thing. Yeah, one of the reasons I ask is because one of the I think the only thing I can think of that I think anarchists should uh, get involved with the state on is uh, jury duty, as they call it, jury duty, uh, because you do have the opportunity if that person has not, uh, there is no victim, if the person listed on the piece of paper is the state of Arizona or the U.S. federal government, uh, you can say uh, no, not guilty. Uh, so you can do a sort of a jury nullification. But one of the things I know about it is they do everything in their power to make sure those jury people have no idea they can do that. Is that right? That is absolutely right. I'm not allowed to talk about it. When I'm, uh, when I'm in front of a jury, I can't say, ladies and gentlemen, the jury. Um, yes, the st he did what the statute says, but the statute's wrong, and the, the conduct in this case shouldn't be illegal in the first place, and you have the right to nullify um, this law by voting not guilty regardless. Um, I can't even say that. If I said that, I'd be uh, in big trouble with uh, the bar. Then you'd um, be in jail. No, I'd be, I'd be in big trouble, and I'd be uh, uh, probably calling Mark down the hall to um, help me out. But at any rate, um, that's a very, very sad thing. It's one of the things that um, um, that we're severely limited by in a presentation to the jury. Another, of course, being we're not allowed to discuss punishments um, with uh, jurors, which is absolutely ludicrous to me. Um, there's uh, there's actually a lot of jurisprudence um, surrounding this very issue. And um, you know the, the, the fact that we can't tell them uh, the severity of punishment to me makes no sense. Uh, every other decision that we have in our life, 
the consequences and ramifications at the end of that decision hold a huge amount of, uh, of uh, sway over how much time and effort and energy and thought that we give to a decision, um, whether it's uh, a day in jail or the rest of his life in, in a federal prison. I mean, that's, you're, if, if those are the two things that you're thinking about, you're going to think about uh, those two things completely differently, uh, putting uh, a different amount of uh, thought and critical examination into your decision at that point. I think it's ludicrous that we can't uh, talk about that. I still don't understand uh, any legitimate driving policy reason behind that um, very arbitrary rule. Well, I think uh, if they allowed you to tell the jury that they can just say, no, not guilty because the crime is not, shouldn't be illegal, very quickly, a lot of these, uh, almost all these laws would just be gone. <laughs> and they, they love this stuff. They, they love filling up the prisons. They love arresting people. They love chasing everyone around and, uh, you know, scaring them and all that kind of stuff. So for the anarchists out there, I get a lot of questions uh, like, what can I do? What can I really do? I'm just one person. Well, go down to your local courthouse and pass out some jury nullification information to people coming into the courthouse. Ask them, are you going on the jury? Here, check this out. It's things like that. These are little things that we can do because obviously, as, as uh, Andy pointed out, uh, they're not even allowed to tell them uh, they'll get in big trouble if they do, which is, uh, you know, just beyond crazy. But the whole thing's crazy. Uh, so, um, yeah, Jeff, that's one, you can one be thing. on my jury anytime, my friend. <laughs> Hey, if you didn't hurt anybody, just we're done here. Why, why am I even here? Why are you wasting my time? Which is, of course, more than half of the crimes that, uh, mm -hmm. that I defend. So there you yeah. have it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, thank you so much for doing what you do. And uh, same with Mark Victor. And I'm sure there's a few others out there like you, but I haven't met them. Uh, well, actually, you have. I wanted to give a, a shout out to my friend Alessandro Fusillo. Uh, over in Italy, who's been a guest uh, yes. at, on your program before. I, uh, I also had the privilege of meeting him and uh, picking his brain about uh, criminal defense fighting he's doing over there for, for uh, freedom in Italy. And, um, you know, kind of um, comparing the, the uh, procedural and substantive systems of our country. So they're out there. We, we're out there and we are uh, we're rocking the boat in our own little spheres of influence all over the place. So that's what we're going to keep doing. Yeah, I forgot about Alessandro. So that's three that I know of, decent lawyers. <laughs> uh, so anyways, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. I, I'm looking forward to meet you down here at Arcapoco. I think Mark wants to do some sort of panel or maybe some sort of speech related to this sort of stuff that you guys can give us some information on, on uh, what you're doing. Uh, but uh, yeah, I want to thank you for coming on. Is there anything else you want to finish up with or let people know about? Well, um, if you want to know more about uh, the efforts we're doing in Arizona and uh, throughout the Southwest United States, you can check us out, attorneyforfreedom.com, attorney, F-O-R, freedom.com. There's lots of great stuff in there, press of things we're doing in the state of Arizona and beyond. And uh, you'll find lots of great articles in, uh, in there written by uh, Mark and uh, stuff in there about uh, the efforts that we're doing to make the world just a little bit more free of a place. Yeah, I, I, so anyone out there, definitely keep that in mind. If you're in the U.S., you have a major problem with the uh, justice system, the injustice system, as I call it. Um, you know, I would definitely put them on, uh, first on your list to call. Um, and actually, Mark Victor has these fridge magnets with attorneyforfreedom.com on it, and he tells people to put it on the uh, underside of the fridge because that's probably when the cops cut you down in handcuffs where you'll be able to see it best. Uh, so, yeah, great guys. Really looking forward to uh, meeting you in person, Andy. I'm looking forward to seeing Mark again. And for anyone who wants to come and hang out with all these kind of people, amazing people from all around the world, Alessandro was at Narcopoco last year from Italy. Uh, so many people came from all over the world. We're going to have even more next year, 2017. Just check it out at narcopoco.com, February 25th to 28th. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe, share. Send it to some of your uh, people, uh, your friends going to uh, law school. Uh, let them know what they're getting themselves into and, <laughs> and try to smarten them up to be more like uh, Mark and Andy and actually try to fix the system and not just be a part of it. So that's it for Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, Thanks, and anarchy. How was the conference this year? Absolutely fantastic. It's an amazing experience. The conference is great. It's the best thing I've ever been to, probably in my life, honestly. It is a blast. It's really fun. There's so many things to do. Um, just the spirit, just the energy, amazing moments, amazing people. It's really, really fun. It's better than you could expect. I think it's the best conference I've ever been to.